I'm starting to not see dreams as much as I am starting to see purpose. See, dreams are things your mind entertains as fun and full of fantasy, but purpose, purpose grabs the heart and changes the world. It's interesting, really. We start with a lucky penny to start living out a dream to turning to God and finding a purpose. In God we trust. Four words with a big impact on a simple penny. Todd Conitzer, February 9th, 2009. I was raised in Spring Hill, Kansas. It's a town of about 5 to 6,000 people. It's on the southern outskirts of Kansas City, and I guess if you had to label it, you would label it a farming community. What it was apparent though is, is as I was raised in that community, I realized right away that I was probably a little bit different than most. I've always been a dreamer, a person that always thought of big grandiose things, and it was so bad at one point. <laughs> My mom actually pulled me aside and said, "Todd, you need to get your head out of the clouds. You really need to start focusing in high school and and try to figure out what you want to do and lay down that groundwork to be a good worker to, you know, work for your family and build something." But I always had these grandiose things that I wanted to to go and aspire to do. And that kind of filled into my high school years where I decided to do acting and acting was an outlet for me to be able to see the world through the lens of people writing things so it wasn't just this little community now acting in Spring Hill Kansas was not um on the top of the list our tables were put together as a stage in the cafeteria and that's how we performed so needless to say being in a small community me thinking of different things and grandiose things was not something of the norm so much so that um my senior year i had a friend named debra holt write in my yearbook thank you so much todd for sharing your dreams and visions for your life it was just something that i always did it was just who i was so you flash forward right and life happens you decide to go away to college and i went to three different universities settled at Kansas State University where I met my now wife. Now see when Sheila and I first met it was just one of those things where we just knew. We just knew at some point we were going to be married. We just gelled that way. I was the dreamer and had these visions and grandiose things. My wife was the planner, but she could do implement processes to help those dreams and visions come to fruition. And so we matched Now the dynamic was always up and down but we matched in our gifts and abilities which was quite a blessing. So you flash forward and you have children and you create businesses and some of these businesses do really well and some of these businesses fail horribly. And as you're raising children in this environment there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of things that are happening that you're not quite sure Todd, you know, are we going to be able to eat this week? It was it was turbulent times. It was a Friday afternoon and I was listening to a um audio and this audio talked about making a dream list and I was so broke hearted at the time that I was really wanting to get back to that dreaming part of my life and so make a dream list it said and mark it all out so I pulled down a piece of paper and I started writing I wrote feverishly I wrote Uh, all the way down one side of the piece of paper and I turned it over and started writing dreams on the other side. And in this list it then said you need to write down like one year goal 3, 7 and 10. So you would put these goals each one on when you would like to achieve them. It was the first time really that I've actually written out a goal. And so I had this list like and then I went back through and I started writing things that I was praying about and and things that I felt that were being laid on my heart and so I was writing all these other things and components to this list and I would put the list above my computer and every day when I went into my home office I would pull it down and I would look at this list and this happened approximately 2 weeks prior to everything changing for us but the list 
just one of those moments where I, I believe was at the right time, right place for everything else to happen. And we actually started going to church in 1996 and we were baptized and faith became a component of dreaming then because then it's not just your dreams, gifts and abilities, it's God speaking into it. So that whole faith journey was a weird turning point for us. And I, I look back on it as a blessing, but I also look at it as some people go, I don't understand how that could even come into play. God isn't really real. I mean, come on, Todd. And I understand that. So, but everything changed for us 2006. And I think when you see the rest of the story and you understand where we were, we were broke. We, I was on the end of my dream list. My business was failing. They were knocking on our door, basically starting foreclosure process on our house. We were not in a very good place, but that's sometimes where you need to be for a dream to happen and for miracles to show up. So that's where we start our journey. That's where we were on September of 2006. Now let's see what happens. Dare to dream. I remember I, I prayed a lot because I worried about you driving that across the country. Find a penny, pick it up, and all the day you'll have good luck. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe in luck. It all pretty much started just about here. Right here, this store has now changed. It used to be a Borders Books. And that night, my wife and I decided we were gonna go on a little date. And on this date, we were gonna go to Borders Books, check out some different books, magazines, and just make a night of it. On the way out, something happened. You see, what started out as something that would be normal ended with me looking down and finding that. A penny. I proceeded to tell my wife our luck and our life is now changing because we have found this lucky penny. And she just shook her head. She's like, Todd, come on. So I took this penny, proceeded to put it in my pocket, and told her, oh honey, our luck's changed. Life is getting ready to be different. <laughs> she didn't find that very funny. What do you think of when that whole whole thing happened? Did you have people say anything when I had the Winnebago there? I have people, is he crazy? <laughs> <laughs> they didn't ask me that. Did they ask you that? <laughs> Ask me if I was crazy. When you go out to eat, I pull the penny out, I put it on the table, and I was like, man, I can't wait for tomorrow. I put it back in my pocket, and she just was shaking her head. We get home, and instead of just emptying my pockets, I left the penny in, emptied everything out, it was time to bed. I went upstairs, and I pulled the penny, and I put it on my alarm clock, and I said, honey, I can't wait for tomorrow. Our luck's gonna change. And she finally said, just shut up about that dumb penny. I was like, oh, how dare you? And so we went to sleep. The next morning we wake up. She's hurrying because she's running late to work. She works at her church. So she takes off, runs out the door, heads to work. It's raining. I can no longer paint for the day because of the rain. And I kind of roll over and I see the penny and I remembered what I told her. And I started chuckling to myself. I said, okay, it's, it's on. So I grabbed the penny, grabbed that dream list, and I saw Jay Leno. And I'm like, oh, what can I do with this? And so I, then I saw Route 66, and then I kind of put it all together where I saw old Winnebago from Christmas Vacation. I was like, wouldn't it be cool to have one of those Winnebagos drive Route 66, go to the Jay Leno show before he retires? And so I run upstairs, bust through the door to my office, and I started creating an eBay auction. I, I just was kind of creating it as I went along, but I knew the story I wanted to tell only because I wanted to poke fun at her. So then I packaged the video and packaged the eBay auction, get it live, I was so excited. And basically the video went this, 
is a lucky penny. I want to show my wife it's lucky. I found it last night. I want to trade the penny to an old Winnebago, drive Route 66 to the Jay Leno show before he retires. Please bid on this penny or I might take trade offers. Then I took the whole thing packaged together and I sent an email to everyone she works with because I knew those who were sitting around her were going to open this auction up and sure enough, hear my voice in this eBay auction. <laughs> I chuckled and chuckled, sent it out, sure enough, within minutes, everyone was laughing in the office and hey, did you see what your husband did? And I get the phone call. Sheila picks up the phone. I pick up the phone and I said, yes, honey. And she's like, you take that auction down right now. And I was like, mm -mm, it's a 10 day auction. We're going to see where this goes. I didn't realize what I had just created. See, the penny went to a dime and then it went to a quarter and then it went to a dollar and then it went to $5. And everyone was chuckling and having fun. This was like on a Friday afternoon. I didn't realize what was going to happen next. People started sending me messages. How would you like this trade? Would you take an M&M poster? Would you take this? I'd give you a baseball bat. I mean, they were giving me trade offers for the penny. Plus the penny was going up in value. By the time Monday hit, our local news station, KSHB, here in Kansas City, decided to pick the story up as like a local piece on their new news story. Local man trying to trade Penny to live out a dream. That was the title. I was like, wow, this was on Monday afternoon. People went flooded to the eBay auction. They started bidding on the Penny. The Penny was going to 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 dollars. Then trade offers accentuated and they started getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So it started out and then it went to like a baby goat. Then it went to laser hair removal. Then it went to like DJ services. I was like, what is going on? It was a 10 day auction and every day I decided to start a blog on what the trade offers were and that everything was coming in. I was like, this is nuts. As the auction continued, the trade offers got bigger. The penny went to 200, 400, $500. We were now over a hundred thousand people at the eBay auction. And then Dustin messaged me. Dustin is a computer person in Phoenix, Arizona area. He reaches out and he goes, I'll give you a brand new computer system for that penny. At that time, it was about a $3,500 value in 2006. And I said, done. Pulled the eBay auction down because you could pull it down with no penalties, like 48 hours prior to the auction ending. So I pulled it down, left messages on the blogs. This is what happened. Stay tuned. And I contacted Dustin. That afternoon, I booked a, basically a, an airline flight from Kansas City to Phoenix, Arizona for one day. I would fly out in the morning, we do the trade and I'd fly back. Sheila comes home and I told her what happened. She goes, Todd, no, what are you thinking? Are you serious? You just spent money on airplane tickets on this penny and we don't have any money. What are you thinking? And I was like, I don't know. I think it's going to be fun. She goes, well, at least we have a new computer. And I'm like, no, honey, I'm going to keep going with this. So she wasn't really exactly enthused about it, but she agreed to let me go. I flew out, met Dustin. Unbelievable. A great godly man, I, I, a complete stranger. We really had no contact other than a couple emails. He took me all around Phoenix. We went to the new um, Cardinals Stadium before they had the field rolled outside and the sun was shining. And I said, can I get on? He goes, absolutely. So I go running around the field. I'm taking pictures with this red book. See, the red book became the dream book. These were dreams people were sending me from around the world of things they wanted to live out. And so I started a scrapbook putting their dreams in it. And I said, wherever I go on any kind of adventure, I would take pictures with the book. So you're going with me. It was an amazing day, big pictures with cactuses. And then we went back to his office, took pictures. And then I just said, wow, this is incredible. I boarded the plane that night and headed home. And when I get home, Sheila's like, well, are we done? And I was like, nope, I'm going to take this, put it on eBay and we're going to see where it goes. I still have to try to get to that Winnebago. She's like, fine. I went ahead and put it back on eBay. The traction really wasn't there, but there were still people coming. It just wasn't as exciting to some people. But what happened is, is I started reaching out and I found a car in North Kansas City for a 1992 Chrysler Baron convertible. I reached out to the gentleman. I said, this is my story. This is what I have. Would you be willing to trade? He goes, yeah. So I jumped in the car, ran up to North Kansas City by the airport. We met in a parking lot. He looks over the computer. I walk around the car. I take a 
quick ride around in the parking lot. And I go, are you willing to do the trade? He said, sure. We do the trade. I don't even know his name. To this day, he's become this mystery person. I jump in the car and I'm like, oh, I can't believe this is happening. I was just so happy. I'm driving back down and the car, all the lights start coming on. Things are blinking, the brake lights, the check engine lights, things are just chaotic and crazy. And I'm like, did I just do something dumb? Did I just ruin everything? So I get back, pull in the driveway, everyone's excited. My kids come running out. We're taking pictures with the dream book and the car and I can't believe this just happened. And everyone's laughing, we're having a great time. <laughs> And then I was like, now what do I do? So I went back and I was like, well, I can't do an eBay auction. How about I do this? I'll just reach out on Craigslist. So I started scouring Craigslist around the United States looking for an old Winnebago. And it took me about five to seven days and I discovered a Winnebago in La Crosse, Wisconsin. I said, would you be willing to make the trade? I explained the story and he said, absolutely. I need a daily driver back and forth to work. I was like, okay. He goes, well, it's Sunday afternoon. I go to work tomorrow and then I'm gonna go deer hunting for over a week. So if you can make it here by tomorrow morning, we'll do the trade. I was like, okay. This was about three o'clock in the afternoon on a Sunday. And you'll find out really quick on how long your list of friends is when you discover, hey, it's Todd. Remember this journey? Would you be willing to go to La Crosse, Wisconsin this weekend or tonight at midnight and drive back tomorrow in an old Winnebago? Needless to say, most people said no. My wife reached out to her best friend, Renee, and said, hey, you guys are driving back from Oklahoma. Would Rod be willing to do this trip tonight with Todd? Rod's like, yeah, I think I'm up for it. So sure enough, Rod tries back into town at like nine o'clock at night. All right, it's about two o'clock in the morning and I've managed to make it to Rod's house. He lives in North Kansas City. Say hi, Rod. Hi. <laughs> He's really excited, I mean, you know, pick him up two o'clock in the morning, take a wild trip to uh, Wisconsin, and come back. So yeah, now we're hitting the road. Now it's official, we're out the door. So hang on, I can't wait to see what's gonna happen next. I've already been pulled over by the cops once, so who knows? Hang on for the ride, here we go. Start Off to La Crosse, Wisconsin we go. It's about an eight and a half hour drive. Meanwhile, through the whole night, we're talking, laughing, or kind of like dumb and dumber, honestly. Freezing in this car, because it's a convertible. Hey. We made it to Minnesota. Look, there's Rod. Hey. <laughs> hey, I wanted to show you something. Look right down here. You see that? That's a real Minnesota stream. They have real running water up here. I bet you guys didn't know that. All right, we gotta go check the oil in the car. We're about an hour and 30 minutes away from our destination of the Winnebago, and I'm freezing. It's cold up here. <laughs> they even got some snow still around, so, all right. Stay tuned, man. A lot going on. Talk to you soon. Say bye, Rod. Bye, Rod. <laughs> Later. We're getting almost there. About six in the morning, we start having problems. Overdrive stops working properly. All of a sudden, I'm like, what are we gonna do? Everything's jerking, so we pull into a rest stop. And I said, Rod, I think if we drive faster, it'll be okay. So Rod's like, okay, let's do it. So we jump back in the car. We end up driving anywhere from 75 to 85 miles an hour, so it would stop kicking out. And we pull in at about 7.30 a.m. to a CVS, which is about two blocks away from Dave's house, the gentleman that has the Winnebago. I said, Rod, I need something to drink. The car now is overheating. I am panicking. I'm walking around CVS and I'm going, what if we don't, what if he doesn't make the trade? How are we gonna back to Kansas City? What if I make the trade and this Winnebago is a piece of junk and I can't make it back to Kansas City? And it was that moment, I, I think I was in realization of where I was and what was going on. And this journey was bigger than me. Rod and I stood about 10 minutes in that CVS and I get the phone call from Dave and he's like, hey Todd, where are you at? And I'm like, I'm right down the road, Dave. I'll be right there. He's like, okay, remember I have to go to work. I was like, yeah. So we drive up. And Dave and his wife are out there waving with their little dog Gizmo and they come walking up and I'm like, Dave, I need to tell you something. In the last couple hours, we've been having to drive fast because I think overdrive's getting out and it started to overheat on us. I understand if you don't wanna make the trade, but I don't wanna do something that you would be upset after I drove away and then all of a sudden you'd be upset. And he goes, no, he goes, I'm good. I was like, okay. So we walk around the Winnebago. And this joy, it's like, I can't believe this is happening. We walk around and we're looking at everything. He's explaining how it works. We jump in Winnie and then we take a ride around the cross. And at this moment I was like, I can't believe this. This is amazing. Hey guys, I made it. 
excited. I'm here. I'm in Wisconsin, and we're driving in the RV. Look, here's Dave. He's driving. <laughs> there's, there's Rod. Hey, this thing is awesome. I can't wait to get it home and show you guys. We only got another, what, eight, eight and a half hours to drive home, but that's okay. But isn't she beautiful? Can you see back there? Now that is beauty. So we're going to go back and take some pictures. We'll hit the road here after a while, and uh, we'll be home hopefully before 10 or so later. So he's like, okay, here you go. Let's, let's, you know, so we trade keys, we take pictures, do hugs. Believe it or not, Dave lived on Winnebago Road. I can't even make it up. So I, I stopped and took a picture of the sign. We jumped back in Winnie, took a picture with the biggest six pack in the world. And I was like, I'm really on this crazy adventure. But on the way back, Winnie would only go 45 to 55 miles an hour at best. And there was a lot of sluggishness to it. And it just caused a lot, it, we were driving and drive. It took forever to come back to Kansas City. Gas mileage was anywhere from four to five miles to the gallon. And it was just a very long, long drive back. We ended up coming in at about midnight after I dropped Rod off and thanked him. And I pulled in the driveway and I really just sat in the driveway with my hands on the steering wheel going, I can't believe God that I'm here. I can't believe this happened. So I get inside, I lay down and I go to sleep. I wake up the next morning and you would think it was like Christmas. I put on my clothes real fast. The kids come running out and because they have school and we're out there walking around the Winnie and I'm showing them the inside and Sheila's just looking at it like, what are you thinking? And so, but she was supportive as a wife could be. She's like, okay, well maybe this craziness is done. And so she goes back inside and I sit, after the kids leave for school, I just sit in Winnie wondering what was gonna happen next. And this is where I think a lot of people would think that the story just took off. And I made the trip in Winnie and I did all these amazing things and we went to LA and that's where you and I were both sorely wrong. So I may have gotten to Winnie in less than eight weeks, but what happened was incredible. So Sheila comes home from work that night. And she goes, let's lay the ground rules, Todd. You can make the trip to LA to see Jay Leno, but you can't use any of our money. I'm like, well, what am I supposed to do? I got to fix some stuff up on Winnie. She goes, I don't care. I'm just saying that you're, you can go make the trip, but you're going to have to find a way to support and fund this without using our own money. It's like, okay. I can figure that out, I got to this point. So I took the Winnebago, cause I couldn't sit in our driveway forever and I drove it to Spring Hill, Kansas and I parked it alongside my mom and dad's business and, which they owned an antique store. And then I was off on the adventure. At first I had to figure out different ways to do some sort of a sponsorship. The first way I've decided to do it was bumper stickers. I thought this was creative because in NASCAR people pay for advertising, you put it on there and I could use that for sponsorship. So I started doing that. I started selling bumper stickers and people could hand write the bumper sticker for $10, $20. And I would put the bumper sticker on Winnie as support and money started to come in. And then I would start selling things like if you wanted a lucky penny, I would sign a lucky penny for you for $2, I believe it was. And I'd send it out. And then, um, so donations came in sporadically and I was able to like get a new carburetor for Winnie. I was able to fix the radiator. I was able to fix things on Winnie because at this point I knew it was gonna be, I don't know, 25 hour drive out to LA and a 25 hour drive back. That's a lot, especially in gas. So this process now was going into two and three and four months. And out of nowhere, a gentleman named Rick Crowell, he reaches out and he goes, Todd, I think I'm supposed to help you. I was like, okay. He goes, I'm gonna create a website for you and then we'll use that website and then we can do donations and I'll help you do all the graphics for the bumper stickers. And Rick was like a little angel to me out of nowhere. So Rick joined the journey. So he would do things at night when he had the opportunity, he would do all the graphics, we'd put everything on Winnie. And it was, it was amazing to see, but see four months turned into five months, five months turned into seven months, eight months turned into a year and Winnie would slowly get money to come in and Winnie would slowly get things fixed. But the nuance of the journey was dying. There was really no support. Even though I had at this point almost 500,000 people from around the world tune in and send me some amazing things and send me dreams from all over, the silence of that was deafening. And my wife, Sheila, God love her, was no longer really supportive. At what point does your spouse look at you and think you're kind of crazy to continue the journey. You start questioning things like, well, is it me? 
trying to make this happen? Is God speaking into this? Is this ego? Is it pride? There was a lot of self-doubt. So after a year and a half of going down this journey, Sheila was finally like, Todd, it's time to sell Winnie. But I couldn't. See, we would go for rides in Winnie. I would pick the kids up from school in Winnie. Uh, we did camping trips in Winnie a couple times. The memories that were being created with Winnie were great, but the dream that I originally started to see Jay Leno was slowly fading because Jay was getting ready to retire. And maybe it was just a crazy adventure to this point. Maybe it would never come to fruition at all. And then God went silent. God didn't really talk about it anymore to me. I didn't get to hear, you know, those little nuances and those little wink, God winks, I call them. They, they weren't showing up. And I finally was like, that's it. Here's the deal, I'm just going to sit back, God, and if you want this to happen, it's gonna happen. If it doesn't happen, it doesn't happen. But I am done. I am tired of thinking about it. I'm glad that I made it this far. Nobody's following anymore. Nobody cares about this journey. Why did I even try to even do this? Maybe I am crazy. I'm done. If you want it to happen, it's in your hands. And it was silent. Through that winter, I would go down and shovel off Winnie, because it would have so much snow on it. I would start it up, I would check the different fluids. But the journey itself, I thought, was over. I didn't know what to do. I was getting to a point where I was getting ready to sell Winnie. And then, one morning, out of nowhere, months into it, in the shower, as I'm taking a shower in the morning, I heard an audible voice say, it's time. And that was it. And I started giggling. I was like, it's time. Come on, God, is that you? What was that? That was creepy. What is going on? I was like, okay, well, you better not be talking about that penny because my, my wife's in there and she's going to ch ch chew on me. And then uh, I get out, I'm, shot, I'm drying off. Sheila's like, Todd, why are you laughing? I was like, you're not going to believe this, but I just heard a voice and it said, it's time. And she goes, you better not be talking about that penny, Todd. I don't know what this means, Sheila. All I know is I heard the voice. I don't know what it means. I sound crazy. I understand all that, but that's what I heard. That's why I'm laughing. Finishing sh getting dressed, I'm taking, you know, drying off, doing my hair, brushing my teeth, coming out of the bathroom, and my phone rings, and it's my dad. Sorry. I don't know why I'm getting emotional. My dad says, Hey, a guy just walked in to the store here and his wife is sick. He used to be a diesel mechanic. He doesn't have any work right now. He saw that old Winnebago sitting out there and he was curious if you need any work done on it. See, what nobody knew was that Winnie's transmission was bad. There was no way it would make it to California and back. I had about $600 in donation money, but I knew it wasn't enough to actually fix the transmission. So nobody knew this information. And I was flabbergasted because not even 15 to 20 minutes earlier, I heard it's time. So I simply told dad, I was like, you know what? If this guy wants to take it for a drive and figure out what's, you know, might need some stuff worked on, I'd be happy to listen to his ideas. Dad's like, okay, and hangs up the phone. It was just no big deal. I tell Sheila what's going on. She's just shaking her head because both of us are kind of in denial. About 15 minutes go by, the phone rings again. I pick up the phone, dad goes, hey, Mike just took this for a drive. The transmission's shot in this thing. You'll never make it to California. It's like, yes, I understand, but I don't have the money. I have some money, but I don't have the money to fix it like it needs to be. And he, Mike goes, I think I can take care of it. Hangs up the phone, 30 minutes go by. Mike calls me and he says, hey, I got the transmission out of this thing. It's an old one, it's an old Chrysler, I can't fix it. Uh, but there's an older guy that used to work in a transmission shop, live here in Spring Hill. I'm going to take it to him. It's like, whoa, 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 wait, Mike, I only have like $600. He goes, ah, don't worry, we'll figure it out. He puts down the phone, the transmission he has taken now to this gentleman, who I've never met, still don't know who he is to this day. He repairs the full, rebuilds the full transmission in like 48 hours. That same time he comes back, Mike goes, I'm putting the transmission back in here, Todd. It should run like a top. Can't wait for you. I said, well, how much do I owe you? And he goes, ah, probably like 500 bucks. It's like, wow, okay. Puts the transmission back in within another 24 hours, three days go by. Winnie's put together, transmission's fixed. I'm like blown away. It's time. I was like, okay, now what's gonna happen? You know, when 
when God shows up and he tells you you're going to do something that nobody else has done, he shows up in a big way. From that point, there was a lot of hurdles that needed to happen. It's no longer in my control. It's now turning into a whole different journey, and that is the simple journey of what's on the penny of in God we trust. Do we necessarily ever trust God? We all try to do it on our own accord. I had to learn this the hard way. God's timing. It's all in God's timing. So from that point forward, uh, miracles started happening. Things that I didn't ever anticipate. So here's how the journey went. Mike fixed the transmission from its time, but there was things that I needed to have lined out. I started journaling. I wrote this journal of all my thoughts every single day and I said, if this is God's timing, if this is something that I needed to do, I needed to hear clearly. I needed to let him speak to me in a way I've never heard. I almost needed like burning bush moments because that's what I needed at this moment. It's been over two years and here we are in this situation and I am now my wife's going to be mad at me. She's over this journey. This craziness is happening. I needed some clarity. So some of the things I asked Clarity on were, hey, if I'm gonna do this journey, where do I go? Who do I talk to? How, where do I stop at? Do I need to probably do it in four and five days. I wanted to interview people. How does that happen? Number two, I gotta get my wife on board. I need her blessing. If we're married and we're in it together, I really need her to be on board with this. And number three, where do I come up with the money? We don't have any money. This is insane. So here's what happened. A few days go by, I'd say about three to four days go by, and I get a phone call out of nowhere, and a gentleman says, hey, Todd, this is Greg Gazak. I think I'm supposed to help you. And I'm like, okay. Uh, he goes, what are you doing right now? And I was like, well, I was getting ready to eat dinner. He was like, I am in Overland Park. Can you meet me at a Starbucks? I was like, sure, what do you want to help me about? And he's like, this journey in the Winnebago, I, I think I can help you. I look at my family and I was like, I'm going to meet a stranger at Starbucks. He says he can help me. A blind faith, I think I would look at it as. So I jump in my truck, I run over there, I go walking in and this gentleman's sitting at a table and he's, he's kind of boisterous and he's, you know, he's, he's got like ADD and he's so excited, you know, and is this and he's shaking my hand. He goes, I've been following your journey. He goes, here's the cool part, Todd. He goes, I make this trip in Route 66. This is my job. I sell trinkets all down Route 66 to LA and back. I do this all the time. He goes, I think I can help you. I was like, well, that's awesome. I said, I really don't know. I don't know the route. I don't know who I talk to. I don't know, you know, I, at the time their GPS was not like a big thing in 2007, 2008, 2009. People had them, but I didn't. So I didn't know who I was supposed to talk to. He's like, I gotcha. So he, he walks out and he grabs a book and he walks back in and he goes, hey, are you gonna write this down? I was like, well, what am I writing down? He goes, you need to get a pen and paper. You need to write this down. It's like, okay, so I scramble around, I find a pen, ask somebody for paper, start writing. He throws the book on the table, and in this book is the actual Route 66, and he opens up and he goes, this is where you're gonna start. Boom, boom. And it's a gas station, he goes, here's, who, here's who's here, here's who you need to talk to, this is who you're gonna meet. And he goes, from here, you're gonna go where? And I was like, I, I'm not quite sure. And he goes, well, how about you stop in Edmond? And so he's showing me Edmond and all the stuff there, and, then he goes, then you need to go here, and then you need to go here. And for the next hour and a half, he lined out exactly word for word, place by place. He showed me people, everyone that I was going to talk to, every stop that I was going to make, everything. And I closed the book with my piece of paper in it. And he goes, I might be on the journey out there. When, you, when are you gonna make the journey? And I was like, well, I really need to decide that. And he goes, okay. He goes, when you make that journey, you need to let me know because I might be out on the road, might be able to help you. And I was like, okay, Greg, thank you. So I took the book home, I put it on the table, and Sheila goes, what's that? I was like, well, you know, I didn't know where the journey was gonna be. I think I do now. So I open it up and I proceed to share with her everything that was lined out. She goes, wait a second. So she's the planner. She has got great processing ability. She starts lining all of this out and it works out to the T, to the, to the times, to, to the T on where I need to be check. A couple days go by and Sheila and I were talking and we're trying to figure out, you know, she's like, I don't understand why you need to make this journey. 
this makes no sense to me. Why would God want you to do it? Just Todd, he goes, she's it's just crazy. So a friend of mine, Ron Lackey, he decides to come over and hang out with us that evening, just kind of sitting around talking. And he, he's sitting there and he goes, Sheila, why is this upsetting you? Why, you know, tell me what it is that, so she lays out her heart and they were all great points. My husband is crazy in essence. Our family needs to make money. We can't make our house payment. They're foreclosing on our house. And he's wanting to do this stupid adventure to Jay Leno in a Route 66 in a Winnebago with money that we don't have. I think every wife on this planet can relate to that. I think most men could relate to that as well. So he just simply says, you know, Sheila, what's the harm of allowing God to speak into this and you support him for an amount of time? She goes, fine. Here's what we're going to do. You get 30 days. In that 30 days, whatever's going to happen has to happen, Todd. You have to make the trip. And I was like, okay, fine. When is that going to be? And she goes, how about we do spring break? You have about two and a half, three weeks. And then you could make the trip in spring break. Time period, we could fly out to LA. We could meet you when you get there. And then we could drive back with you as part of the adventure. It's like, done. Wife on board, check. Where am I going to get money? Remember, we have none. So in this process, what I started doing was is that anyone that would donate a dollar, I just wanted to have a way to say thank you. And so I started taking pennies. And if you gave me a dollar, I would take a penny, put some adhesive on it and stick it to the ceiling and then put your name on it. And I just said donating because Winnie didn't go very far. So a dollar equals one mile. If you gave me $10, I would put 10 pennies. I would put your name and where you were from. And I was constantly sticking pennies on the ceiling. And so people started continuing to donate money. And I was like, wow, this is absolutely incredible. Slowly putting pennies up. I had the journey mapped out. Now I had the dates, but there was something that was missing. I needed to be able to have somebody go with me to video, edit video on the road, upload it when we could so people could follow the journey as we interviewed people. So we would make it in five days. Every day we would stop for the night upload or basically edit everything, upload it to YouTube. Nobody did this in 2009. Nobody. To even think about doing it, there was no such thing as a lot of Wi-Fi opportunities. So we had to use Starbucks and everything like that. So the idea to do this was crazy in itself, but this was something I wanted to do, but I needed to have somebody to go with me. Well, remember Rick? Rick's in New York. And I was like, man, Rick's got all these talents. Maybe he would be willing to go, but he doesn't know me. He's never seen me in a one-on-one -on -one basis. He talked to me on the phone maybe four times. Everything else was just like through emails or messaging. And I just said, Rick, do you want to go? I just decided to help because that's just the kind of person I am. I love to help. I love to push people to achieve their dreams, even though I kind of lack on pushing myself to achieve mine. And he was like, really? I said, yeah. And he's like, let me ask my wife. Sure enough, she says, okay. And I'm like, wow, video person, check. He goes, but Todd, I don't know how I, don't know how I could pay for an airline ticket and all that stuff. And I'm like, okay, if God's got me this far off, it, it'll, it'll work out. Somehow or another, it'll work out. So now I've got Rick on board. He said he can go. I just need money. And then all the self-doubt that you could ever possibly have started piling on top of me. If you could have self-doubt and and it was there. It was, it was deafening on the doubt and whys and the, and I was like, whatever's going to happen, Sheila, it's going to happen. And we're going to, this journey is going to happen. I can't stop it. She's like, okay, I, I'll support you, but just know this is our situation. I said, I understand. So no money, I have everybody on board. We're now 10 days out from leaving. Everyone knows the news stations know. Everyone that was disengaged is now back engaged. Todd's actually going to make the trip. And so I just was sitting there. It's like, where's this money going to come from? I don't know. I got to buy, I got to buy Rick's airline ticket. I don't. So we're sitting eating at the table. And as I'm eating, the doorbell rings and Sheila goes, are you expecting something? I said, no. So I get up and I walk to the door. It is UPS. He gives me a box. I sign. She goes, what's that? And I said, I have no idea. I set it down. And I'm like, this is really strange. I open it up and lo and behold, I open the box and I see like skull and crossbones. I see these t-shirts. I see these glowed weird necklaces. I'm like, what is going on? I open it up and this letter is, it's a gentleman that had a dream and his dream was to own a haunted hilltop, haunted house. So we tear open this box and the first thing I pull out are 
these decals. I'm like, that doesn't look very nice. And then I see these shirts, right? It says the Haunted Hill Top. And then back here it says the Haunt Chattanooga number one Haunted Hill Top. I gotta find out if you're still around, Jeff. In close with this is a check for $300 in this note. <laughs> Sorry. When when you are blessed enough from people sending their dreams <clears throat> from all around the world, it's an emotional journey. Sorry. <clears throat> when you are blessed enough to have people send their dreams to you from around the world and you are broke, you have no money at the time, and there's nothing you can do, but they're investing on your journey and your dream, and they're sending you money out of a place of where they're at because they want to help, and they send you this note. Um, it's just flooding back on me. It says, Todd, <clears throat> here, is you, here is a check for your trip. I also enclosed some T-shirts, some light-up Halloween necklaces for your family, both the skeletons and the pumpkins. Both have two different switches on each side, which was cool. The rope necklace and the pumpkin skeleton have separate switches. These necklaces would glow and they'd blink. It was really neat. It says, have fun on your trip and be safe. Maybe we will even get lucky and get Jay Leno to say Haunted Hilltop in one of your videos. Sincerely, Jeff Chambers, The Haunted Hilltop. It's pretty cool, isn't it? And it was just enough money <laughs> to buy Rick's airline ticket. I was flabbergasted. We ended up purchasing the airline ticket for Rick to fly out to see us, and then he's gonna fly from home from LA once we made it to LA, so we were able to purchase the trip, the tickets for him. I was like, Sheila, this journey's gonna happen. She goes, well, you still gotta have gas money. How much money do you have left? And I was like, we'll just wait for donations. Donations continue to come in the next few days. And then the journey was getting ready to start. And at that time, I had roughly around $500 in cash. But see, there was one thing in the back of my mind that I was super worried about. And that is, what if Winnie broke down? What if I couldn't get Rick to California? I didn't have a credit card. I didn't have any of that stuff. The night before we were getting ready to leave, I get a phone call from a gentleman named Dennis. I'll leave it at that. Dennis says, I need you to come to my office. I need to talk to you. I drive over to Dennis's office. I go in, I said, what's up, Dennis? He goes, you're making that trip tomorrow, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, I need you to take this. And it was a credit card. I was like, Dennis, he goes, listen to me. I, I feel that I need to give this to you. I'm going to give it to you. You use it for whatever needs to happen on this trip. If you need gas, if you need to, I, he goes, you need to take this for just your wife's purpose. I don't know why, but you need to take it. I was like, Dennis, I'm gonna take this credit card because it'll give peace of mind to my wife. But I'm going to bring this credit card back and not use one penny off of it because I think God's got it. He was like, what? Well, okay, but at least it'll make me feel better because I feel led to give it to you. So whatever you do with it, it happens, it happens. I said, I appreciate it. At that moment, Rick was landing in Kansas City. I took off, ran up to the airport. I met with Rick for the first time. Rick and I had to figure out who we were as people he didn't know who I was. I'm the crazy guy. He's on a journey on his own journey, like he's getting in a Winnebago with a guy he doesn't know. He has no idea what's getting ready to happen. Do we gel? Are we gonna fight? Are we, what? I mean, there was a lot of unknowns. And then we drive back down and we go to Chick-fil-A where they throw a big party for us and give a, basically donations of proceeds for the next hour of food to help pay for gas to go to LA and back. So we raised another couple hundred dollars. It was fabulous. That night, we sit around, we talk, we laugh, and Rick goes to bed. I can't sleep, so Sheila goes to bed, and I am sitting there, sweating, sick to my stomach on what's getting ready to happen. I have no idea how I'm going to make it through this. I feel overwhelmed, and I just remember sitting on the couch going, I think I messed up, God. I, you chose the wrong dude for this. But the wheels were in motion because I got a phone call from Channel 41 that they were gonna be at the house at 6 a.m. in my front yard 
so that the whole of Kansas City can see me go on a trip to LA to live out a dream from a penny. It's those moments in the quietness of the night that most doubt comes. I may have had doubts, but I had faith. I was trusting in God we trust. So that's what I was doing. In my own naive way, that's what I was doing. Yeah. So, what are you doing? Are you video recording me? I'm videoing you. <laughs> I'm used I was to it. coming over. I was going to say, you know, I don't know if this guy here has, you know, just has it out for the neighborhood association. <laughs> he appears to be the ramblings of a, you know, of a madman. I don't know what's going on here. Well, I was laughing because I was thinking you guys would wake up when they showed up with the news camera and the whole boom thing and the lights, the whole lighting up the whole street. <laughs> I'm sorry, I missed it. I slept right through it. Oh. Um, so the morning that the journey was about to take place, I remember that it was cold and I was concerned. This seemed like a really bad idea to go across the country with a dude that Todd didn't know that you found on the internet and flew in from New York. I mean, you just put all that together and I was like, who knows who this Rick guy is. I don't know who he is. And Todd's getting ready to take off on a journey a, halfway across the United States in a vehicle that is not reliable. And what happens if you break down in the middle of the desert and you don't come back? Like there are, all these crazy thoughts were running through my head of what ifs. But there were some great friends that just kind of rallied around and we and came together and just became a celebration at that point of this is something that, that we're gonna do. And I was fearful, but I knew at this moment I needed to A, trust in Todd and trust that God had this. So I was a little, little concerned to say the least on the day of the journey. You got two computers, two Bibles, a little, know, bit, of, a little bit of gas money. Oh, a journal and a Bible. I've never journaled until about, I don't know, probably eight weeks ago, and I felt led to start journaling. And now I haven't journaled for two days, but I've got so much. You're going to have a lot on. to write in the next few days. Yeah, I do. And I, I'm, it's humbling. She looks like we had a distinct time that we were going to leave, and that was 8.30. We were driving to Edmond, Oklahoma for our first stop, which is about a five and a half hour drive normally. But we plan on stopping and talking to people along the way on Route 66, doing interviews. And then each night we would edit all of the information that we saw for the day and upload it to YouTube at night for people to watch. That was our plan. It's a very good plan. We hit the road, Edmond, Oklahoma or bust. We make it about 30 miles out and the Winnebago Winnie starts making this amazing noise. It was bang, 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 bang at about 60, 65 miles an hour. And I was like looking at Rick, Rick was looking at me and I go, I don't know what is going on, Rick. This has never happened before. And he goes, I thought that this thing was all fixed. And I was like, I know. So we pull over to the side of the road. He takes the doghouse off. He starts looking at the engine. Okay guys, this is what happens. When you get like, uh, what, how far are we, Rick? Maybe 50 miles from Kansas City. We start getting a, a backfire problem. Got to do a little adjustment on the carburetor. What do you think, Rick? Now you're choking in. Yep. I guess it's a good thing I got Rick here, huh? <laughs> All right, we're gonna get this all worked out and then we're gonna hit the road. And we'll just see how much further we get. Oh, it just died. <laughs> and trying to figure out what was wrong. I call my dad, he instantly starts laughing and he goes, wow, you made it a long ways and you're gonna have to make it to LA in six days, huh? And I was like, yeah. He goes, well, good luck. 
I was like, Dad, no, seriously, how do I fix this? And he goes, it's a timing issue, Todd. You're going to have to try to figure out what to do on the road because you're not going to be able to fix it where you're at. I was like, great, just great. So we put the doghouse back on and we hit the road. Again, for the next hour, bang, 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 bang. And now it's starting to run really rich. And that means that the gas doesn't burn completely on an older engine. So therefore you get a lot of gas fumes that come into the Winnebago itself. I was in a good place. I was laughing. I learned that if I drove a little under 65, it wouldn't happen as much. If I drove a little faster than 65, it didn't happen quite as much. So that was kind of what my game plan was bring in to the very first stop, and that is down in Baxter Springs. Route 66 comes into Baxter Springs at the very bottom part of Kansas. We pull right into that first gas station where Greg Gazak told us just weeks prior where we're gonna start our journey. We bust out of the Winnebago, we go running in, and she was expecting us because Greg said we were coming. She was like, hey, have you met Crazy Legs or Dean Walker? And I was like, who is Dean Walker and who's Crazy Legs? She goes, I'm gonna call him. So she calls him up, he comes down there, we share our experience and what we're doing. He's like, yeah, I've met Jay Leno, shows us the picture. And he's like, yeah, I can turn my legs around backwards. And I am what they based Tow Mater off of on the movie Cars. I'm like, what? Seriously? And he goes, yeah. So we go into the room. He goes, yeah, kick my leg around. I was like, <laughs> I'm not kicking you. I'm not, I'm not gonna kick you. He goes, no, kick my leg around. I said, no, 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 Rick can kick you. So I grabbed the camera and Rick, who now we've only been together for about 48 hours. I have him kicking a complete stranger, knocking his legs around backwards. What? Kick his foot. Kick. Go ahead, kick his leg around. Kick this old man, he goes. So, okay. Go. Go. Oh my goodness. Go. Go. <laughs> oh no, that is so wrong. Keep going. Keep going. That is that is so wrong, Rick. No. <laughs> oh. And Crazy Legs, it was a good time. We laughed. We actually signed the wall that was down there. We just really had a great time. It was a great way to start the whole journey, besides Winnie backfiring all the time. And I was able to just experience that. So from there, we still have to make it down to Edmond. But now that I've gotten a taste of Route 66, do you think that's just a not? No, I wanna see more. You always see the blue whale. So we pull off, we go running out there, and I'm running around the blue whale, and we're shooting videos, and I'm laughing. And it was, I was just, like in this very happy place. So we continue down the road and I see the tallest totem pole in the world. So I'm like squirrel and I go running off and we go five miles out of the way to go see the tallest, tallest totem pole in the world. And since I'm on Route 66, I wanted to see everything. I wanted to experience it all. So Route 66 had your now roads that are current and you have the old Route 66 road and they kind of run parallel together. So I, I saw the diverge in the traffic lanes and I'm like, I want to stay on Route 66, Rick, you care? And he goes, no. We're on Route 66 and as you can see behind me, he goes a long ways and there's really not much traffic. So we veer off and we head down this road. It was the roughest road. It's not maintained. It's the old one lane. Things were bouncing off of Winnie. I mean, crashing down. He was trying to hold on to the computer. He was trying to put everything in place, and we were laughing on how horrible it was. Yeah. I want you to know something. When it comes to Route 66, <laughs> it hasn't been maintained in a while, and it's a little bumpy. Rick, can you can you show the folks on what we're dealing with here? We're really not quite sure where we're at. He's like, wow. I said, yeah, we're going to have to make some choices. We're going to have to stay on some of the old and some of the new, and we'll have to get off of the new to see some of the old. So we tried to make a balance of it. So we get back on the normal highway that was parallel to Route 66, and we continue down the path and stopping and talking to people. It was actually amazing to see. So we're pulling into Edmond, Oklahoma. Traffic's getting crazy because you can't really follow Route 66. And Darren's like, where are you at? You're now, you were supposed to be here at like 1.30 and now it's like five, where are you going? You know, and I'm like, we're gonna be there. We're just running in traffic. I've been dilly-dallying and having fun. He's like, okay, that's great. Just call me when you get here. So we're supposed to be taking this off ramp to go up to this exit to meet Darren. And we weren't even quite sure where that exit was. Go off the off ramp. And as we go off the off ramp, I go to slow down. And my foot goes straight to the floor. 
and I realize I have no brakes. I'm pumping Winnie like this, and literally, since we're going up a hill, Winnie starts to slow down from the momentum and being uphill. And I'm looking at Rick and I said, we have no brakes. And we coasted just to crawl at the top of the off ramp. And he goes, what are we gonna do? And I said, I'm just gonna keep going at like 30 miles an hour off on the shoulder. We'll put the hazards on. And he's like, we just need some sort of a sign. And when he says that, <laughs> off on the right side of the road, if you live in Edmond, Oklahoma area, you know there's a church called Life Church with a humongous cross. And he was like, that's our sign. And I was started laughing. I was like, yeah, that would be a heck of a sign. We take that exit, Darren calls, and I said, this is where I'm at, there's this big cross. He's like, oh yeah, I know exactly where you are. He goes, go over the bridge, there's a gas station, I'll meet you there, you're right down the road from where I live. <laughs> it's like, okay, look at that, perfect timing. So we go over the bridge, and I am at peace with all of this. Um, I've seen too many things that got it done up to this point to not be at peace. So I was great. We coast right into the gas pumps and I coast to a stop and put it in park. Rick's like, what are we gonna do? And I was like, I have no idea. I need gas, so I might as well just get gas. So I jump out to start filling up Winnie. He jumps out and goes underneath Winnie as a big puddle of brake fluid just continues to form outside of Winnie. And he's like, Todd, we broke one of our main lines for our brakes. It's like, wow, okay. I said, is it fixable? And he goes, well, I think so. I'm not quite sure. It's an older, I was like, okay, just do what you can. And I start putting gas in. About this time, Darren pulls up and he goes, he's chuckling. And he goes, well, at least you made it here. And I was like, no, we'll be all right, somehow or another. And I didn't come this far just to stop here. So I'm putting gas in to one of the three gas tanks when he has. And Darren's laughing. I said, is there a parts store anywhere close? And he goes, yeah. He goes, but I think they're getting ready to close. And I was like, well, let's put gas in. Rick's under there and he's working all of his magic trying to pull this line off. And he comes out and it's an old line that's all bented in tube. And he goes, I, I don't know where we're gonna get one of these. It's like, no big deal. And I went into the gas pump attendant and I said, I'm leaving the Winnebago here and I'll be right back. He's like, okay. I said, just don't call the police and don't call a wrecker, I'll be right back. So we run over to like five miles away is this parts store. We go in and I show him the part and he goes, wow, he goes, I haven't seen one of these in years. So he goes back to the back and he comes out and it's just a straight tube. He goes, you're gonna have to bend this thing to where you want it to be. So we buy everything, jump back in the car. Within 10 minutes, we're back to Winnie. And sure enough, there goes Rick. He's underneath there, he's bending the tube. He puts everything. Hey Rick. Yeah. Why don't you explain to everyone what you're doing down there on this Winnebago? What happened to us? Uh, scheduled maintenance. Sketch. Schedule maintenance. What do you think, Rick? We lost the brakes. We didn't have no brakes. Yeah, just brake line. Well, what do you call this part of the journey? Who needs a brake? Nobody yeah. needs brakes. <laughs> so you got the two by four and the so. handle four inside. <laughs> so here's what we got. We got Rick underneath Winnie right now replacing the brake line because we had no brakes. So uh, just add it to day one, right? Day one. Check. 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 Check it off the list. Scalpel. Well, let's go. Fix her up. We're ready. Okay. He puts everything in, we bleed the brakes, and within 35, 45 minutes, Winnie is back up and running, brakes and all. So we go and spend the night at Darren's house. We have a pretty good laughs. We upload our video for the evening. We get ready for the next adventure the next day. All right, all right, Darren, it's day two, man. I'm taking off. All right, buddy, how all right. you doing? We'll okay, you. all right. Day two. Day two, our next stop is Amarillo, Texas. Here's the crazy part is as we leave Darren, which he found that quite comical with all the gas fumes, and we hit the road. And along this way, I get a phone call and guess who it is? Greg Gazak. He's like, Todd, are you on the road? And I was like, absolutely. He goes, where are you? And I said, my next stop's Amarillo, Texas. He goes, oh, I'm right ahead of you. He goes, well, stop in Amarillo, I'll meet you there. Just call me when you're getting close. And I was like, well, yesterday it took us a lot longer than I thought it was going to be. I said, we'll try to be there as quick as we can. He goes, no big deal, just call me when you get there. I was like, okay, cool. I was kind of surprised at him being on the road and now he's ahead of us because every time we would stop somewhere, we would walk in and say, Greg was just here, he told us you were coming. So how did you tell him how you heard? I met, uh, I've known Greg Gassack, he's a souvenir salesman. He was on his way in here to meet me last night, yeah. and uh, he said that he had met you, yeah. and he, you were going to come and shoot a web, live web show video, last night. Show yeah. last yeah. night. So, so well, I went online and looked it up, and 
and I said, well, what, oh, Winnie, I, mean, I recognize <laughs> Winnie right away. So he was stopping ahead of us and telling everyone we were going to be there. Although most of the day we had to deal with the backfiring. It was continuing to get worse and worse. The, actually, the muffler was starting to poof out. Rick had actually had to use a coat hanger to kind of hook it back up again because it was so bad. Also along the way we were seeing Route 66 items and when we would stop at like, say the drive-in, the old drive-in, I started to do this thing dancing at these different places. I thought it would be fun and creative and different that at the end I could show a Route 66 montage of me dancing different places. But uh, it was actually a good time. We actually were able to stop at the U Drop In, which was featured on Cars, which was a pretty cool place. Then we stopped at a Route 66 museum, which they knew we were coming, so we hung out there for a little bit and shared in the history. That night, we roll into Amarillo, Texas, and Greg has purchased us a hotel room. It was incredible because one of the things is I didn't have a lot of money, and the money I did have, I was spending on gas, and so Greg was basically helping us out by supplying the hotel room. So that night, we had pizza, we hung out, we uploaded a video, we shared what was gonna happen the next day, and we got a good night's sleep. Day three, our stop for the day will be Gallup, New Mexico. Gallup, New Mexico was a little ways away, but along the way, we were gonna see some great sites. One of them was Cadillac Ranch, where all those Cadillacs were up and down. It was an amazing site, and while we were there, I was started talking to people. At this point, I decided to start asking people about their dreams and asking to dance with them. So I had different people dancing with me, which was neat. We stopped at the Midpoint Cafe, which then I met people from different people around the world, was able to show them Winnie. And every time I would show people inside of Winnie, they would ask, what are these pennies on the ceiling? And I would say, this is donations for gas to make the trip. And people would just inherently give me $20 or $40 or $50. And this is how I was getting money to pay for the gas. I wasn't out there actively asking, people were actually just walking up and giving me money. It was a very humbling experience to say the least, but it was also God showing me that he's got it. He's got it taken care of. It was a great time. We stopped at the Blue Swallow Inn, which is an iconic place that you can actually stop at. And he showed us all around with all of the different murals that were painting everywhere and all the famous people that had stopped there through the course of years like Clint Eastwood and just amazing people that had been there, movie stars related. Route 66 is just full of so much history. We roll into Gallup, New Mexico. Greg had gone ahead of us and he was waiting for us and he goes, take this exit, exit 16. I was like, okay, great, where are we going? He goes, you're going to the USA RV park. We pull in, he had rented an RV space for us that evening. I park, we get in and we start looking around. It's a super nice place. John is the owner. So we wake up that morning and when we wake up, I go in to see John. John's an interesting individual. He has a huge heart for military and veterans and he just, he runs a really clean ship and he has dreams of his own. So I'm explaining to him different things. And he goes, hey, I, I want you to have this. And he reaches into this bag and he pulls out a cross and he gives me this cross. I was like, well, what is this? And he goes, every year here, there is a, uh, a festival that we have where we, the Catholic community gets and they walk up this mountain that takes almost all day and it gets to the top and there's an old cathedral that they had up there and they bury, he, you bury things to get blessings. And he goes, and I take all these crosses up there and I bury them and then through, I get the blessing on the crosses and through the year, I give out crosses to people that I feel needs God's blessing and strength. And he goes, Todd, you are in a unique place and you need as many blessings as you can. And I think God's got his hand all over this. And it was a reminder to me of the journey that I was on was very different than most people's. And I did not want to take advantage of the situation and to stay humble and stay true. So I left there being very encouraged. So we left Gallup, New Mexico. Our next stop was gonna be Kingman, Arizona that evening. This way we were able to stop and see additional sites. There was nothing that was supremely out of the ordinary that day. Uh, we had a lot of fun talking to some people. We did some random dancing in some different places. Which was really pretty neat to see. We stopped at Yellow Horse, which is right out on the border, which is these amazing rocks. And then you have some Indian heritage that was going on, which was really cool to see. And then standing on the corner in Winslow, Arizona, uh, that was fun. I ended up dancing there. We actually met a few of the shop owners because Greg had said that we were coming and they were waiting for us, so we went in to see them. So that night we roll into Kingman, Arizona, 
and this will be the last night that I see Greg. Greg rented our hotel room and we hung out that night, shot a few quick little snippets and laughed about the journey and everything that had happened. Greg's like, all right, he goes, tomorrow you'll roll into LA. He goes, I wish you luck. I'm glad that you allowed me to come. And that would be the last time I've seen Greg face to face in over 10 years. We wake up that morning and I get a phone call from Sheila saying, Todd, you're supposed to be on the pier at 6 p.m. in California on the Santa Monica Pier. Are you going to make it? I was like, absolutely. Why wouldn't I make it, dear? She goes, well, I'm just making sure because once we board the plane, we won't be able to talk to you again until we see you there. And then you have to drive back with us. And I, it's only a one-way flight, Todd. Are you gonna make it? Um, the girls were so excited as I was calling Todd to see where he's at and hearing of the various hiccups that were happening along the way, I had some doubts that I was, should I even get on this plane? But then I'm gonna let these two kids down that are super excited. But that was a big leap for myself to jump on a plane without having any knowledge of if there was gonna be somebody there to meet me on the other side. I said, yeah, we're gonna be there. Don't, don't you worry, you get on there. And I'm chuckling because Winnie isn't really starting. <laughs> I'll talk to you soon. Bye. It just died. Choker. Suck some of the gas up in. Give me one of the tanks, man. We were close. This was an interesting challenge day because now we're running into California, going across the desert. Rick's like, Todd, I'm kind of tired. I'm gonna lay down. So he lays down. We're getting the backfiring, of course. And so he lays down to take a nap. As he's taking a nap, I'm just kind of taking in the scenery. I mean, it was beautiful. I'm, I'm enjoying this because through the whole event, Rick has been sitting behind me editing video on computers. Next to me has been empty. And I don't mean to sound cliche, but it, that whole thing of Jesus is my co-pilot scenario did play in my mind a few times. And I was always just had this constant uh, smile because of the feeling that I was having in this moment. It was a, truly a blessing. About an hour and a half in, Winnie stopped backfiring and started going from 65 to 60 to 50 and starting to spit and sputter to 40. And I'm like, it's dying. And in the middle of the desert was an off ramp. So I took the off ramp and I went down and there is literally nothing around. And Winnie died. And so I'm like, oh my goodness. I go back, I wake Rick up and I said, Winnie's dead. And he goes, what, wait, wait, what? What do you mean? What, what's going on? I said, it just died and we're in the desert. He goes, Todd, this isn't good. I was like, no, I know it's not good. And he goes, how far out are we? And I said, well, about an hour to Barstow, California. So he gets up to take the doghouse out. I go outside to walk around and clear my head. As I'm walking around, I just had this overcoming peace, like it's gonna be okay. I've Everything that has happened to this point, it's gonna be just fine. Do not panic, stay in the moment, be thankful. I go back in, Rick's like, Todd, it's the other gas pump. He goes, there's an electric gas pump and there's a mechanical gas pump on here because it has three gas tanks. He goes, the electrical one's not working. I'm like, okay, so what does that mean? He goes, well, one, we have to try to get it started again. It's like, okay, no problem, let's get it started again. So he starts messing around, messing around, messing around. He finds a way to put his hand over the carburetor to build enough suction that the mechanical gas pump will actually pump enough gas in to actually get Winnie running. So it's running really rough. We throw the doghouse on, I throw it and drive, and we take off. But Winnie will not go any faster than 40 miles an hour because then it would start to run out of gas because the gas pump couldn't keep up. It was running 40, we had hazards on, semis were flying by us, cars were honking, and I had a sign in the back that said Jay Leno or bust. Literally, that's the way we felt. We're driving to Barstow, he, we're talking, he goes, hopefully we can find one of these gas pumps when we get to Barstow. We get into Barstow, we find a, a parts store, we pull in, we get out, and I'm like, he's like, how much money do you have left? And I said, like $250, and he goes, I don't know how much this pump's gonna be. And I was like, it is what it is. Let's just try to figure it out. So he crawls back underneath. He's like, all right. So he goes inside, he finds the gas pump. He comes out and he goes, Todd, it's gonna be $200. Will we have enough money to make it? And I was like, yeah, we'll have enough gas to make it to where we need to go. He goes, but that's all your money. And I was like, yes. Now in the back of my mind, I will say that I was thinking about the credit card that Dennis had given me a while back. Knew that I wasn't going to need it. For whatever reason, there was this peace about the situation. So he was like, okay, let me go under and pull the other 
gas pump off and then I'll go in and exchange it and then I'll bring this one out. It's like, that's fine. So he crawls back under, he starts working and he's under like two, three minutes. And he goes, wait a second. He goes, hold on a second. I'm like, okay. He goes, all right, now try. And I was like, what do you mean? He goes, just try to start it. So I flip the switch and I hear that electric gas pump come on. And sure enough, when he fires right up and I'm like, what? He go, I go, what happened? He goes, it must've been those rough roads. He goes, the ground wire had rusted and it had pulled off. He goes, all I had to do was hook everything back up. He goes, everything's fine. We don't have to spend any money. Let's go. Okay. We are in Barstow, California. The last, I'd say what, 70 miles, Rick? When he was cutting in and out, cutting in and out, not going up hills, dying, going off to the, we had to, uh, pull off the side of the road and hung out in the desert for a little bit. We're now at an auto zone in Barstow. We just worked on some stuff with the electric fuel pump. So we had some problems with it. So now we're hoping it's fixed. We've got the last leg in. Not a whole lot of videos today because we were in the desert pretty much most of the five, six hours. So we throw the, the doghouse back on, we get everything together, we hit back on the road again. We're running into LA. We had a time of 6 p.m. to meet on Santa Monica Pier. And I was like, this is crazy. Are we gonna make it? Sheila lands and she calls and she goes, are you anywhere close? And I said, yeah, we're actually, we're, we're gonna make it. We're gonna be there. And she goes, are you gonna be there at six? And I was like, I'm not quite sure with traffic, but we're gonna try. So they boarded and got on buses and trams or whatever else they had to do to get to the Santa Monica Pier from the airport. We continued down the path on the highway. And so as we pulled in, I saw the ocean and I was like this overcome of joy. Like I cannot believe we've actually made it this far. As it hits 6.30, a car pulls out exactly right on a corner, on a little corner area, he pulls out, and there's just enough room that I can pull up and back in and park. When I get out, it says free parking after 6.30 p.m. I know this sounds so small and insignificant to so many of you, but to me, it was such a big thing because even the smallest thing I felt God had his hand on that was a worry that I had. So all it did was reconfirm my faith on the journey and what was getting ready to happen. We actually went down, we walked down, we meet with Sheila, we meet with a group of people that were waiting for us on the pier and I said, let's dance. So we all dance and we're having a great time. We shoot a couple videos down there and everyone's like, let's go to Johnny Rockets. We're gonna walk down here. We'll all have a celebration. I was like, that's cool. I said, can Rick and I just stay back and shoot video of the sunset to kind of capture this moment. And they're like, yeah, go ahead. So I'll have to finish the rest of the journey at Jay Leno and it uh, should just be a great time, guys. And I want to thank you all of you for tuning in and uh, we'll give you some more updates tomorrow, but dare to dream. So they walked on and Rick and I were standing overlooking Santa Monica Pier up on the ridge here and watching the sun go down. We're having this conversation. Sun goes down he goes, okay, let's go. And we start walking and he goes, how much money do you have left? I said, it, uh, I have 200, like $250. He's like, how are you gonna make it back? I remember that so distinctly. I said, like, I don't know. I said, but I've seen so many things, Rick, from everything that's happened, from losing the brakes and you know all the stuff. I said, I'm, I just, I, I don't, I, God's got it. About 75 feet after that conversation, we're continuing to walk, my phone dings. It's PayPal. My grandmother gave me $100. <laughs> and I started laughing and I said, look, Rick, there's a hundred dollars for gas. He's like, that's crazy. What I learned was, is every day that we were uploading a video, my grandmother would have the neighbor child come over and basically show on a laptop the video of where her grandson was and what he was doing. She's no longer with us. Another hundred feet go by and my phone dings again. This time it's from my father-in-law. He just wanted to make sure that his daughter could make it home. I don't blame him. Crazy son-in-law he has. So I said, look, Rick, I'm $200 up. I'm now at 450. It'll work out. It always, it's just been working out. We've seen miracle after miracle. I just got to trust. So we go to Johnny Rockets and we have a great time. We watch street performers and we're having, I mean, we just enjoy that moment. That night, Sheila had a little money from something she had done before she left. They were able to get a hotel room. Rick and I went to spend the night in a McDonald's parking lot. That next morning, we get up to go to the Jay Leno show. The goal of what we went on this whole excursion to, to LA to do was to see the Jay Leno show, just to see it come out. We go to NBC Studios, and of course, we had to sit and wait. So while we were waiting, what did I do? I had everyone dance. It was like a celebration dance. It was really awesome. We, we waited in line for almost two hours. And as we walk in, there's a gentleman standing there and he says, no cell phones, no cameras, no nothing. 
And if you are, you're gonna be kicked out. It's like, oh, how's everyone gonna even find out that we made it here? I can't even video it. He goes, are you together or separate? And I was like, well, if we're separate, where do we sit? And he goes, you'll sit there. And it was next to John Melendez. If you remember him on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno, he was a gentleman that would be a writer and he would hold up the coffee cup. I was like, I'll sit there. So I went up and sat down next to John Melendez and I was just happy. I was like, wow, I'm actually here. We actually made it. Jay comes out to do his little thing before the show. I was hoping I would be able to meet him. It was something that just didn't happen. We just sat back in and started to enjoy the show. Rick was sitting somewhere else. As we were sitting there enjoying the show, the commercial break happened. The gentleman that was sitting next to me, John Melendez, I look over and he sees the book and he goes, what's that? I said, it's a dream book. Here's everything that's happened. People have been sending me dreams all around the world. It's from this lucky penny. I came here to meet Jay, this and that. He was like, wow, that's actually pretty cool. Commercial break's over. We go through the next segment, commercial break. I said, hey, John, what's your dream? He goes, what do you mean? I said, well, if you could live out a dream in your life, you've done so many amazing things, what would it be? He goes, I wanna be in a Steven Spielberg movie. Write that down, put it in the book. I said, absolutely. So I put it in the book. See, I wasn't gonna get to meet Jay, but I met John and I was able to hear and experience him so in the back of my mind, I'm thinking, how in the world is anyone gonna even know I'm here? As the show progressed, at the end, there's always a musical singer. And this musical singer was a little bit different, of course. And so he starts singing and I'm watching him and he does something very unique and different that I've never seen happen. He actually leaves the stage that he was on, walks up the flight of steps, about six steps up and he stops right next to my row and I'm five people in and the camera is on him and the audience, which there I am with my big smiling face. See, even something so small to me was so big because it was like God saying, hey, I got this too. I got this. I was like, wow, this is really pretty neat. Show ends, we get in the Winnebago, we enjoy the rest of the evening. Rick and I kind of have a reflection moment. The next morning I have to take Rick to the airport. So I take him to the airport at like 5 a.m. and I'm dropping him off at LAX. He's like, Todd, this is the, the most ex amazing experience I could ever ask for, thank you so much. I was like, no, really thank you for all the time, energy and effort and everything that you've done. Before Rick goes, <clears throat> Gosh, I don't get upset and choked up because I'm sad. I get choked up because of how humbling it is. Rick goes, I brought $150 for souvenirs. I didn't spend all that money. Here's $100 for gas money to make it home. It was like another confirmation is like, wow, thank you, Rick. I don't think he ever really understood. <clears throat> Rick left. I did a reflection video thanking Rick for everything he did. That afternoon, I picked up the girls and my wife. We jumped in the Winnebago and she goes, hey, I've saved a little money. I would like to take the girls to Universal Studios. Can we do that? I was like, yeah, absolutely. That would be a fabulous way to do. And she goes, then before we go to Vegas, cause I had an interview the next day, why don't we stop and go halfway? So halfway would be Barstow. I was like, I know where that is. We start driving to Universal Studios and what starts happening is Winnie starts going bang, 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 bang and the gas fumes start pouring in. It smelled so bad. Like I like literally got headaches riding in the darn thing because of the fumes that came into there. Um, it was a clunky, gosh, a clunky tin can is what it was that smelled bad. And she looks at me and she goes, did you drive all the way out here like this? And I said, yeah. She goes, Todd, it's pretty bad. I was like, yeah, I've learned to try to drive above and below that. I said, so I'll try to limit that. I'm really sorry. She goes, is the kids gonna be okay? And I said, the kids should be fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, she goes, it's gonna be a long drive back, Todd. And I was like, I know, Sheila. I was like, but I've made it all the way out here. It'll be okay. So we go to Universal Studios. We jump back in. We had a great time. We start off to Barstow and it is getting late. Barstow is a little ways away. So we're rolling into Barstow at about 9.30 PM. For the last two and a half hours, all we've heard is this backfiring. And I can see Sheila sitting over there, not upset, but just like concerned. And I'm praying the whole time going, God, please. I know we've made it all this way. I've dealt with this this whole time. Is there anything that I, is there something I can do? Can you fix this for me? And we pull into a Taco Bell because the kids are hungry. And we pull in and as we pull in, another vehicle, a truck pulls in next to us. And there's no one in the Taco Bell parking lot, not one other person. And I'm like, oh boy, the guy's kind of an old boy. He's like, you know, kind of that, I don't know, motorcycle looking guy. And he gets out and he goes, one lucky penny, huh? He goes, what's it all about? And I was like, I just told this story for six days straight. And the last thing I wanna do right now 
is talk about the lucky penny. I just want to eat some food and I want to go lay down and, and rest. And he starts pressing and we're walking in all together, him and his, and his wife and us. And we get to the door. I open the door, he walks in ahead of us and goes to the line. We go in behind, he turns around, he goes, man, he goes, what kind of engine that thing have in it? And I said, well, honestly, it's the old Chrysler, big block engine, and it has in there. He goes, man, I had one of those in my old truck. He goes, I drove that all over the country when I did construction. That M effort would never die. And I started laughing, I was like, well, I said, I got issues with mine, so hopefully that's the case. And he goes, well, what's wrong? And I said, well, it's doing this weird backfiring thing all the time, haven't been able to figure out how to fix it for six days. He goes, this is what you're gonna do. I was like, okay. He goes, you're gonna go get a 3 8 socket. And he goes, you're gonna go out and you're gonna pull that doghouse off. You're gonna look on the side of the engine and on the side of the engine, you're gonna have like your distributor cap. But away from the distributor cap, there's like this bolt over here. You're gonna put that 3 8 inch on there. You're gonna loosen it up just a little bit. You're gonna take the distributor cap and you're gonna move it just a little bit and then tighten the bolt back up and that SOB will run like a dream. And I said, really? Okay, this is my answer to prayer. This is what I get, these specific instructions. I'm like, come on. It's like, that's great. So we separate, we go sit down, we start eating and we get done eating. Sheila goes, there's a hotel over here. It looks pretty cheap, but we can save money. And it was $35. It was the worst hotel I've ever stayed at in my whole entire life. We actually had to prop a chair against the door because we were worried about somebody kicking it in. So it was an adventure. We spent the night, we wake up the next morning and I turn to Allison, my youngest, and I say, Allison, you wanna go work on Winnie? And she goes, yeah, let's go. So we run out to Winnie, I pull the doghouse off like we've done now, I don't, numerous times. And I said, I, here's my 3 h socket. He says, I gotta look for a bolt. So I'm looking on the engine, she's sitting over here and she's looking and I said, she goes, well, what's it look like? And I said, it's like a bolt, it's supposed to be. And she goes, is that it? And I look and I was like, there's this random bolt between everything. There's nothing even really around it. And I was like, yeah, I guess. I put the socket on it and I loosen it up and I'm like, by golly, that distributor cap looks loose. So I'm smart enough that I put a line on the distributor cap because if I move it too much, the timing will be messed up and the winning won't run at all. So I put a line on it. I take the distributor cap and move it maybe an eighth of an inch. I tighten the bolt back up. I fire Winnie up. I say, I guess we'll see what happens. We get in. We start driving to Vegas and there was not one backfire. Winnie never backfired again, ever. I could run it at any speed. It ran like a dream. It was the most amazing blessing because since day one, every day I dealt with the backfiring. And God uses unique people at unique times to solve a situation if you're willing to just listen. We pull into Vegas, we go and we run around. People were yelling at us because they saw the lucky penny and how awesome it was. We spend the night there. I do an interview with the company that's there. I get up the next day. We go see some other sites along the way. We stop and see the Hoover Dam. We end up going to the Grand Canyon on the way back. We're really not having any issues. We're just enjoying the moments that are happening along the way. We end up staying back in Gallup, New Mexico at the RV park so I can introduce my wife to John. We spend the night in the RV in Winnie and as we wake up the next morning, there is a big puddle of gas underneath Winnie. It's probably about this big. It must have been dripping all night. I find out that it's from the, the other gas pump, the mechanical one that goes up and down. It was The seal was leaking and there was no way for me to fix it. I needed to buy another gas pump and they're cheap. They're only like $20. But the problem is, is that there was nowhere that would carry this gas pump in all of Gallup, New Mexico after making numerous phone calls. Sheila said, well, what are we gonna do? And I said, we're just gonna have to drive. And she goes, well, we're gonna be leaking gas along the way. I go, yes. And she goes, are we gonna catch fire? I said, I don't think so, but if it does, then we'll just have to get out and let it burn. I didn't know what else to do. But again, I thought in my mind, God's taking care of everything up until this point. Why would not this be another situation? So we keep driving and it, the smell progressively gets worse. You could smell the gas fumes from the leaking gas. And I'm like, we need to pull over. At about that time, we see another large cross. It's called the Stations of the Cross in Texas. If you've been on I-40, you know where this is. It's a ginormous cross. I said, let's stop there and check this out. We pull in and we park and it was just at sunset. And it was the most amazing moment that I think I had on the whole trip. I was able to experience the Stations of the Cross and everything that they have done there. It was a, we stayed there until it got completely dark and I completely forgot to even check 
what was going on with the gas situation underneath Winnie. We go running back to the Winnebago to jump in to take off and Sheila goes, you didn't check the gas. It's like, oh yeah. So I grab a flashlight, I get out to see if it leaked underneath. It never leaked. It never leaked again, ever. From that point forward, I was like, well, that's really weird. I was continuing to check it as we were driving. We stayed at a hotel that next night and I woke up and there was no leaks underneath. I was like, wow, this is crazy. Our last drive in to Kansas City, we ran into some very heavy winds and the kids were freaking out because there was all this noise going on. I mean, it was 25, 30 mile an hour winds coming through Oklahoma and Winnie started to just completely fall apart. It was one of those chaotic moments where the actual awning started flapping like this. I heard it hit the top and then go flying this way. We actually ended up having to cut the, the awning off on the side of the road when we were in Texas and leave it on the side of the road. And then we continued to drive and the wind was getting so bad it was creating a vacuum. And as it created the vacuum on the other side, it started to pull the wall out from Winnie and I was actually having water come up from the road and hit me in the face as we were driving. So we had to stop, pull over, and we had to take and we spent another 20 minutes screwing screws in the Winnie to keep it together. Oh, it was crazy. Then we ran through a tornado watch and a warning, and then we finally make it into Kansas City at 10 p.m. It was an amazing adventure in itself. We actually danced in front of Winnie and when it was all over that night. I ended with $84 in cash left, 84. I got a phone call that morning from one of my painters, because I still had the painting company, and his name is Corey. He said, Todd, my truck won't start. I think my battery is dead. And Corey didn't have any money, and the house wasn't finished yet, so we couldn't pay him. So I spent $50 of the $84 to buy a new battery. See, God knows everything. He knows the whole thing. He knows what's gonna happen, how it's gonna happen. And the other thing is, is I never use that credit card. I was able to take that credit card back to Dennis unused. You would think that the story ended there, but I tried to go and do other things. I ended up trying to take Winnie to live out other dreams and help other people, but to no avail, nothing else really happened. That was, we, we returned on March of 2009, and by April of 2011, which was two years later, it came apparent that Winnie needed to be sold. It was probably one of the hardest decisions I've made in a while at that point, because how can you sell something that God did so many miracles in? What was the point of it all? So I went down and I started pulling all of the decals off of Winnie and I cried a lot. And so it got to a point then where all the decals were gone and the new owner was coming to pick it up. And so I took, at this time, two years later, my daughter had a baby and I now was a grandfather. And then my youngest was a little older. She was two years older. And I said, let's go down for one final ride in Winnie before it goes away. So we go down and we jump in and enjoy a sunset. Last voyage in Winnie around town, and it was it was kind of nostalgic. Yeah. It's kind of sad. Yeah. I don't want to cry. I'm not gonna cry. I'm not gonna cry. <laughs> anyway, it was a lot of fun, and I remember. Always gonna be up in I guess it's all the memories. Don't you cry either. So, all the memories and all the fun we had, it was just wonderful. And I'm glad you guys got to share um, a piece of our life and what we've gone through and where we've gone. And it's just another chapter in the book. So tomorrow, when we see Winnie drive away, I get to interview those people. I hope you guys enjoy it. They're going to carry on the tradition they promised me. And we'll just see where it goes from here. So the best thing that we could say is, dare to dream. The next day the owners came and they picked up Winnie and I watched it drive away and I thought, you know, life is gonna continue on, but I always struggled. I struggled with why, 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 why did this all happen? What was the point of it all? It seemed so, it's, it seemed ludicrous to go through all of this energy, effort, time, heartache, arguments with your spouse and why? And when he drives away, and I just was always left with the why. I saw all these miracles. I always explain to people this, is is like, I had Jesus ride with me 
in that other seat for 12 days. And when we got back, we got out of Winnie and he gave me a great big warm hug and he goes, man, that was the most amazing experience. But I gotta go. You can call me and talk to me whenever you want, but I gotta go, I'll see you later. That's what it was like for me. I didn't have the why answered for seven more years. I know why now. You guys, everybody says, what's the inside of Winnie look like? Well, here you go. Here's the cockpit. This is where all the magic happens. We got buttons, and we're talking old buttons, new buttons. We got the old Motorola right there, the radio, kind of loud. So this is where the magic's going to happen of driving 25 hours. You know that's important, because you got to have magic, right? Now these seats, they, they turn, so that's kind of like an added luxury. But over here, I'm going to show you around a little bit. Got the table, we can place the cards on. This pulls down, makes it into a bed. It's your standard Winnebago thing. But here's the classic. Don't you like the moose and the bear? That's pretty cool, isn't it? Then we've got the, you know, just the standard cabinet. Hey, look, I've been looking for that. That's my sweatshirt. Um, we got the standard back here. We got the green grill. I like to think of it as maybe avocado. Now, these are the things that need to be repaired because the grill doesn't work, refrigerator doesn't work. So those are the things where the money's going to. We got the bathroom right here. Of course, you got to have a commode, a mirror, so I can check myself to make sure that, you know, my painting clothes look good before I head out the door. We've got a little privacy curtain because back here, this is the bed. Now, I've got to get some... I don't know, cushions, because it seems that the cushions were thrown away because they had mice in them. So that's the way it works, I guess. And back here we got more storage. Now, I hope you guys enjoy Winnie as much as I do, because 25 hours there and 25 hours back is going to be a fun time. So there's the tour. It's quick, simple, and that's pretty much it. You guys take care. I remember that day. I remember waiting and this couple shows up with their young ones and I was so excited for them to have their own memories in Winnie. And it had been enough time has passed that I thought this might be a great family to carry on some sort of tradition in Winnie and have them have their own memories. It was a good day actually. It was sad, but it was actually like the closing of a chapter, a closing of a book. Yeah, we all cried. We cried more about selling Winnie than we did selling our house. <laughs> I didn't I didn't want to sell it because that was my childhood for a couple years. Like that was the thing that I got off the school bus and I ran to tar the roof with you. Or I ran to go fix the motor. I had no idea what I was doing, but I was handing you like wrenches and it was like our project that we always worked on. All the pennies on the roof. I, I remember dad coming back with like a whole bunch of chains and we would just have to go up and like pin all the pennies on the roof like you uh i would hand you a penny and you would put it up and it would do it for hours it would mama bring us sandwiches for dinner so i was able to sit and walk around with them and show them everything and tell them all the stories and show them the pennies on the ceiling and the people and the dreams and all the things that happened over the course of that time and i was just like handing that over to them they were very excited they had plans to go camping in winnie and write down their camping places that they've been and they're going to go and I, I just, I, I don't know, it just felt good. I watched them pull out and I watched them drive down the road and I just sat and watched them go and thinking, is this, is this it? Is this the closing of the whole chapter? Is this how it was supposed to end? But I never, I never got the why. God never gave me the why. He never said, this is why it all happened. This is the why it was laid out. And so a few months go by and ding, my phone beeps, and I look down, and it's a Facebook message, and somebody says, I just saw Winnie. And I'm like, wow, wh where was it? Driving down the road? Is it, you know, what's going on? Were they going camping? Were they doing? No, it's sitting on the side of I-70 outside of Columbia. I was like, well, that's weird, because the people that purchased Winnie actually were North Kansas City area. I, I didn't think they lived outside of Columbia, but maybe something happened, or maybe they were camping I, I don't i didn't know the story a few more weeks go by ding another facebook message just saw winnie todd dare to dream i was like really so this time they sent me a picture and sure enough sitting in front of a house outside of 
Columbia, Missouri on the side of I-70 on the south side, there Winnie sits. It's like, wow, it seems a little odd, but okay. This had gone on now for months, and then a year goes by and two years, and I'm getting random messages, you know, dare to dream, showing me pictures of Winnie, and the longer it went on, I never really felt the desire to go find Winnie on the side of the highway. I did question, though, the why. Why was it that I was led down this huge journey that started out with a lot of, yeah, I would say pride and fun and joking that turned into a God journey with miracles and humbling experiences and trusting in God and dreams. Why did it happen? Why did thousands of people tune in? Why me? Why did I make the journey to begin with? It seems almost like a waste. As years gone by, the question always mounted in my head, the why, the why, the why. Well, then somebody approaches me about possibly putting this in a book and I'm trying to still figure out the closing, like trying to figure out what was the reason for it all? And I was just disheartened because I could never figure it out. Well, one morning, it was raining. Do you see a correlation? Here it had been years, and it was raining when we started the journey. And here it is, it's raining, and I get up. For some reason, something was going on in my head. I guess it would be God pulling at my heart, saying, hey, today you're gonna go find Winnie. <laughs> and I was like, there is no way I am driving on I-70 today to go look for this Winnebago. I'm not doing it, so I'm not. So I made breakfast, I made coffee, I sit down, and it was like, no, you're gonna go find Winnie today. I'm like, I'm not going to find Winnie. This story is over, I am done with it. I, I, I don't see the reason for it. And so by about 10 a.m., it was so loud that it, the prompting to go to find Winnie that I finally just gave in. But this time I had a video camera with me and I was going to record what I was getting ready to see. Maybe, maybe to put closure on it for myself. Maybe to tell the world that anyone that knew about the Penny story to let them see the closing chapter. And by now, I kind of knew Winnie was not in a great place. I knew it was owned by a person that probably just let it, you know, deteriorate a lot through the weather and the elements. So it was disheartening and I didn't really want to see that. I wanted to remember Winnie for everything that happened and the whole story that transpired. So I didn't want to go see it in disrepair. But I picked up the camera and I headed out. So today, it's raining, so I thought, you know, what would be kind of fun is to go on a little adventure. So we're gonna go on a little adventure, peeps. A little walk back in history. <laughs> Let's see what happens. I remember that day driving to see Winnie. I was so upset with God that I didn't even turn on the radio. I literally just sat in silence as I drove down the highway, wondering what I was going to see, why I was going to see it, what was the point of this. I was, I was honestly pretty upset that I was going this direction. I wasn't even quite sure how far I was gonna to have to drive because I didn't even really know the exact location where Winnie was. I remember popping over the hill and I remember seeing a sign over here and I was looking at a building that was kind of in disrepair. I was like, wow, that'd be kind of a cool place to shoot pictures. Right after that, I saw Winnie sitting there and I buzzed right by. I was like, well, there it is. And this flood of emotions come running over me like all of the memories. And even though it had been seven years that had passed, I, I wasn't ready to see it. So I ended up driving another four miles down the road, turning around and coming back down on the highway, taking the exit. When I pulled up to the front of the house, the house is in complete disrepair. I mean. The, the grass and the weeds have grown up about four foot tall, and I could tell immediately there was no one living in the house, and it was a person that just liked to collect a lot of stuff. And when I looked inside, there was dust and everything in the house, so I just realized that nobody lived there. And for whatever reason, and I don't know how, this wonderful young couple that owned Winnie, that drove away, no longer owned Winnie, and it ended up in the hands of this gentleman that for some reason just decided he was going to keep Winnie. I don't know if he decided to live in it. I don't know what his intent and purpose is, but he parked it right in the front yard for everyone to see, dare to dream as they went down the highway. Well, peeps, I went on a little adventure today because I felt led to. And this is kind of a sad day. 
honestly. I made it here. And you're like, what is this place? It's right outside of Columbia, Missouri. And I keep getting texts about Winnie being seen on the side of the road. So it's raining today and I thought I'd come see. And there is nobody that lives here any longer. And somehow or another, they got Winnie in the last seven years. And it's just sad. It really is sad. Here's Winnie. Everybody's always asked me, what happened? Well, after I sold Winnie seven years ago to a family, they were going to use Winnie to go do racing and stuff and go camping. Somehow or another, whoever purchased it got Winnie from there. And then they just kind of tore her apart for no reason. I mean, the crazy part to me, I think that's still my original license plate. I think Winnie is actually still registered to me. July of 2011, that's when I usually have to post. I think that's my license plate. I don't think they ever registered. So I don't think they switched the title or nothing. There's no one to talk to. The house is abandoned. There's crap everywhere. Here's the other thing that's weird. Look at what they did to the inside of Winnie. This is where my heart, my heart sunk, peeps. Like, sunk when I walked into Winnie. So, I'm keep looking to see if anyone's gonna walk out, but there's no one here, it's abandoned. So let me turn it around and so you can see inside. Sunk. So, the door, they apparently decided they were just gonna rip all the windows off for whatever reason. And when a hoarder gets a hold of something, you don't know what they're gonna do. There's a dead mouse. The engine looks like it's all still pretty much intact. The carburetor was new. That is the seat that I spent hours, hours and hours and hours in. And Rick, my friend, you sat right there. Table's gone. Everything's kind of ripped out. But you know the coolest thing that I saw was a couple things. This is I saw the dates that I took my family camping in Winnie. And whoever purchased Winnie, I think, went to somewhere and wrote theirs. And this is neat. Even though the ceiling's messed up, peeps, look. All the people that donated money along our journey. Bob, five miles. Jamie and Brittany. Melanie. Mike and Melanie. Kenda. Golden Paperclip. <laughs> Les Loker. Pat. And then down here, it's just a complete and utter disaster. I don't know if they were living in it or what they were doing. The walls are all messed up. The ceiling's all caving in. Um, yeah. I don't even know what to think. I guess this is the conclusion of Winnie. There's no... I was looking for a key, no key. As I finished writing the book, I had to have some kind of closure on what happened. Originally, I thought we could purchase Winnie and maybe Rick, we could take it out to Rick, New York, and he could work on it, but Rick, my friend, that would need a miracle. Man, is that just sad? <laughs> All right, I just wanted to give you guys an update heading back home so if you see Winnie on the side of the road it says dare to dream right there that was the dreams of a lot of people still functioning though because I still get texts and messages when they see Winnie so so those little things I guess so I'm just gonna end this with um, dare to dream <laughs> when I was walking back to the truck Something came over me. I just got done shooting video, 
And a little voice in my head said, you should go check the mailbox. Maybe you could find out who lives here. Maybe you could ask them their backstory and find out how they got a hold of Winnie and what they were using it for. Maybe if we could just get a name on that mailbox. The road was pretty much a dead end. It was just a frontage road, so I knew there was just one mailbox. And if it was completely full of mail, then nobody really came around. So I argued and finally walked down to the mailbox. I opened the mailbox and sure enough, there was a few pieces of mail and my head was, in my head I'm thinking, well, somebody still comes around to collect the mail. So I looked to see the name. I was like, I'll look him up on Facebook and I shut the mailbox and I started to walk away. As I started to walk away, <laughs> that same voice says, turn around. You need to go back to the mailbox. I'm like, I'm not going back to the mailbox. This is crazy, but sure enough, I turned around, went back to the mailbox, only to notice that there was a, an additional mailbox that was right next to it for a long period of time, but it was no longer there. Well, where could it have been? Why was that gone? So I look into the ditch, and in the ditch, I find this big rolled up blue tarp. It's like a piece of foam, and it's just in the ditch. I mean, there's so much trash around, and the ditch is about four feet below, and I'm seeing this, and it was like, go down and check out that blue tarp. Like, this is goofy. Sure enough, I walk down, I kick the blue tarp, and underneath the blue tarp is the other mailbox. By now, this mailbox had been sitting in the ditch for years because all of the grass had grown over it. It was just intertwined on top of it. And so my mind thinks, maybe there's a piece of mail in there. Maybe this was the mailbox for this particular property, and maybe I could find out the name of who was here and I could contact them. Of course, that's logical to think through. <laughs> So I pull the mailbox out. I just literally had to pull it through the weeds and I really wrestle with it and I pop it up and I open it up to find nothing. By now, I'm pretty frustrated that I've made this trip. I'm disheartened to see the condition of Winnie and I find myself in a situation where I'm standing in a ditch looking at a mailbox that has nothing in it and it seems asinine. <laughs> it's crazy. So I actually chucked the mailbox because I'm so upset. When I chucked the mailbox, I looked down at the tip of my toe to find this. And I end up turning on my camera because I don't think anyone would ever believe what I'm getting ready to find. Okay, I don't even know what to think about this, peeps. I can't make this stuff up. So as I was moving some junk that was down here in the creek, I moved something. And look what I found. This is no joke, look. I guess inflation. Maybe it's supposed to pay a hundred fold. Think about it. What can we do with this dollar? <laughs> oh, Sheila, I found inflation. I can't make it up, Penny ditch move something because I felt led to move something and I find a dollar dude there, there's nothing around I want to I want to show you look there's nothing it's just trash I'm in a ditch there's not there's nothing there was this piece of blue thing and I find a dollar what can we do with a dollar <laughs> dare to dream Wow, okay. My mind is racing right now. So I get done with that video and I'm walking back to the truck and my mind is just reeling. It's, it's spinning. Like how long was that mailbox in the ditch? How long did that dollar bill sit underneath that mailbox? Why now? Why did I make the journey now to go find this, to put a conclusion on this? And it dawned on me that dollar bill being a 2009 dollar bill, coincidence? You can call it whatever you want. All I kept thinking was the hundredfold. The hundredfold. We are called in life to go and do certain things that God might want us to do. We can call them dreams, we can call them tasks, we can call them whatever you want to call them. They have a direct impact on thousands of other lives. If you don't go to do them, there is no direct 
path to these people that will change the direction or correlation of what they should be doing. So it's the hundredfold. I wasn't called to go to the Jay Leno show and live out a specific dream. I was called to encourage people. I was called to be a testimony to what God did in the story. I was called to plant seeds. And I just happened to listen and obey, even though it didn't make sense. And it did cause me some heartache and some arguments and uncertainty and all those emotions that come along with that. I still went forward. So what God reminded me was he reaps the hundredfold. I'm not allowed to see the seeds that was planted. I'm not allowed to see the hundredfold that was harvested from what I went forward and did. What I am allowed to see is that it was well worth everything that happened. So much so that by sitting here and you watching this mere video of me telling the story, there's a possibility to plant a seed in you. <laughs> the penny doesn't end here. And God we trust doesn't end here. It's merely the beginning for you and for me. It is really amazing to think about. I framed the dollar bill. 2009, 100-fold. Will you join the journey? Will you be part of the 100-fold? I guess my only suggestion is, maybe you should ask God where you need to be going, what you need to be doing, and how you should be trusting Him. Simple phrase, on a penny, in God we trust. Do you? Your journey awaits. Isn't that simple? Dare to dream. <laughs> that was the whole thing. That was the whole point of like, um, being unsure about where you're going in life and being okay with it being in God's hands and to never let that inner kid of faith just fall away.